Thank you. Thank you very much. I, 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 um, I'm delighted to be uh, introduced by someone as, uh, as eminent as Lisa, so that's much appreciated. Um, welcome to F2, otherwise known as the unicorn track. Um, uh, <laughs> My, my talk today is on telling better stories. I've, I've got a little image of our book, uh, not to gratuitously advertise our um, fine book that's available on Amazon and LeanPub, um, uh, as well as the follow-up. Um, uh, it's because, it's just to give you a little bit of history for this talk. So it is, a, it is quite a new talk, but the uh, topic sprung out of a uh, blog post that I did uh, which was not long after our book uh, was published. So 50 quick ideas to improve your user stories. Um, we had, I think chapter one says, tell stories, don't write them. And chapter two was, don't worry too much about story format. It simply said, you know, it's express stories in any way that you and your team find useful. And we kind of thought we can leave it at that and move on to other ideas that we thought were a bit more important and useful. Um, but it turned out that lots of people were getting the book and were saying, oh, but you know, what should I write in the so that bit? You know, it's, so a lot, of, a lot of people seem to be uh, stuck or fixated on the, the sort of mechanics of uh, expressing stories. So I thought, well, I'll write the chapter that didn't get into the book, and that became the blog post. Um, uh, and this, as I say, that blog post, I'll, I'll give a link to that at the end. Uh, it got a bit of traction, so I thought, well, let's do this as a, uh, as a talk. So similarly, if you're here and you want to sort of share this with your colleagues, it might be easier to just to point them at the blog post because it essentially covers all the material that's, uh, that's in this talk. Okay, um, enough preamble. Uh, it was uh, Agile Cabaret last night. Did anyone come? I'm sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let's, uh, so let's do a little bit of uh, music trivia. So here we are. The, the way this works is you're not allowed to shout it out, OK? So I'm going to uh, uh, share with you a song that I think you know, but I'm only going to feed little bits of information to you. And all I want you to do is raise your hand silently. Don't, don't, don't whisper anything. Don't say anything. Just raise your hand at the point where you recognize what this song is, OK? And don't be afraid, because I'm not going to pick on anyone, so you, you, uh, it's, it's a, a safe environment to raise your hand. Um, uh, but yes, OK, so let's see how you go. We'll start just with the, um, the opening lyrics. Also, you're disqualified if you were here for the sound check. Um, OK, uh, so that's only about a few percent. OK, now a few people are starting to, it's clicking with them. OK, if I give you a bit more. Okay, keep your, keep your hands raised, those who do know it. We're at about a third of the room at this point, maybe a little more than that. Maybe if I give the rest of the lyrics, maybe add a bit of sound. Okay. Get ready for the big head banging bit. Okay, most people know it now. I like it, so there's a little bit of a bit. Okay, so that smells like Teen Spirit by Nirvana, um, uh, arguably the uh, the anthem of the of the grunge era. Um, a song I personally like. Uh, I, I imagine many of you like it too. But um, if you don't like that song, that's okay, and you'd actually in be be in reasonably good company. Um, Kurt Cobain sort of found in his short lifetime that this became a bit of a, uh, an albatross around the, the band's neck. Um, you know, I think until uh, the, the release of the album Nevermind, you know, they were a, a, a grunge band with a bit of a, a, a dedicated local following in Seattle. They, they had you know, a good reputation for their live gigs, but you know, they, they, it was a, a core band of, uh, of local supporters. Of course, this song came out, MTV pick it up, suddenly it's on heavy rotation. These guys are heard everywhere. They crossed into the mainstream uh, US radio, and uh, uh, hence Kurt's reaction. This, uh, uh, this, this quote comes from uh, a live performance they gave uh, not long before Kurt actually took his, uh, took his life. 
We said, we have to play this song next. It's in our contract. This is the song that ruined our lives, ruined Seattle, and ruined your lives too. Now, bear in mind, that was 1994. That was just two years after this song came out. Let's wind the clock forward 20 years. This poor man is going to be turning very uncomfortably in his grave. Um, here's, here's the uh, uh, new look. It's a... Uh, uh, fashion retailer on the on UK high streets, you may you may have them here, um, who can tell you how you can get the grunge look. Um, <laughs> it's three easy steps, I think. Uh, step one, be thin and gorgeous. Uh, <laughs> step two, accessorize with some leather handbags and jackets. Step three, play with your hair a bit. Um, and maybe, obviously, to mix it up, um, go and get a, a decaf soya latte from uh, Starbucks, because it just shows your deep spiritual connection to Seattle, <laughs> which is the home of grunge, by the way. And, and you know, the likeness is, is quite uncanny, isn't it? I mean, you know, there you go. Uh, on top of that, the, the song itself, a great sort of incredible you know, original piece of work, uh, still regarded as you know, one of the finest song, rock and roll songs ever written, uh, has been so popular <laughs> that it's seen many uh, uh, versions, many covers, to put it nicely, bastardizations might be another word. Um, there, there's a lot of stick on the internet for uh, Miley Cyrus's uh, version, but I can assure you it's not the worst. Um, <laughs> A little bit of painful research uh, pulled up this list. Um, you know, you should recognize most of those names. I mean, the Muppets, you know. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, you might not recognize the name Paul Anker. Um, does anyone know Paul Anker? Oh, you do? Okay, well, there you go. Well, I didn't until I, I saw that, that, uh, that rather, rather unfortunate version that he does. Go and find it on the internet, but be warned, you can't unsee that once you've seen it. Uh, uh, well, why, why tell this story? Um, it's because uh, Kurt Cobain's uh, reaction to this one sort of uh, popular, anthemic, and rather brilliant original idea um, is a little bit how I feel about something else you hear quite a lot. Um, <laughs> This is the template that ruined my life and ruined Agile <laughs> and is ruining your lives too. So the next 20 minutes is, is a little bit of therapy, okay? It's, uh, um, and, and the whole thing is about trying to help you to overcome this sort of zombie template behavior. If you're taking photographs, uh, here's a, there's, there are transitions. Uh, you're, you're welcome to take photos, obviously. Um, uh, I do some transitions on my slides. I'll put a little camera icon in the top when the last transition is done, just to help you know when the, there's a good photo opportunity. Um, so I, I asked, uh, with the help of Twitter, uh, for some people to volunteer some real examples. Obviously, I had my own, but I thought it'd be more fun if people sent me some of, uh, some of theirs. Um, so uh, this first one, as a product owner, I want to automate the test so that we don't have incidents anymore. Um, are there any product owners in the room? OK, thanks. Now, admit it. Have you been guilty? Have you ever written stories that say, as a product owner? Yeah. <laughs> You're being publicly shamed here. No. Um, um, are there any web service adapters in the room? <laughs> How much do you really want to deliver that pricing schema? Yeah. Um, uh, this one from Nat Price, yes, as a, a, a disc, you know. These, these guys just spend their days spinning and it just, it just tires them out, you know. They just, God, I go crazy, you know. Um, database. No one ever. No one ever asks what the database wants. You know. Uh. 
Um, the great thing about agile stories is that you can be agile inside a waterfall system. So you can have the engineer who has the story for doing that big upfront design, um, and the tester who sort of has a story to test the story that was the development story. Um, these, are, these are real, folks. These are all real. Um, uh, this one's from a user, though, at least. I, I think I've met this guy in the pub. You, you do not want to get in a conversation with that user. Um, and of course, you know, it, sometimes it ramps up, uh, sometimes it's some very senior stakeholder. So the advice there is change the word I want to I require and everything's okay again. Um, uh, I'm indebted to my friend Tom Roden. He uh, provided this one. I want to be locked out of the system after three incorrect password attempts. <laughs> I felt that, that one does occur regularly in the wild, it seems. A few people on Twitter submitted the same thing. Um, I think there is a market opportunity for anyone who could lock people out after two attempts, because then you know, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be going to get there quicker for the users who really love being locked out. Um, and then I thought that was the, <laughs> that was the one that trumped it. Uh, if you work in investment banking, you seem to get a lot of stories like this. Um, so <laughs> enough, uh, enough of that. Uh, I'll try to give you some practical advice of how to avoid that kind of syndrome uh, and still not feel that you have to abandon stories as a, uh, as a mechanism altogether. Um, but I want to start with uh, some, some contextual setting here. So here I'm borrowing from the, uh, the work of Dan North, who made, made you know, a, a very... Um, important statement uh, some years back. He said, for every story, there's at least two domains. He says, there's the domain of the, uh, the business and there's the, 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 the technical domain. And stories are really about finding the, the, uh, uh, the information that sort of needs to come from each of those and, and having a conversation that sort of joins those together. So in our business domain, that's uh, I, I hesitate to use the word requirement because I don't like it. I think it's a very, uh, it, it's a term with a lot of baggage. Um, but substitute your own um, uh, version or your own words for this. Uh, it might be ideas that we have that we think are going to be impressive in the marketplace. It might be a direct need that's come from a, a, a customer. It might be a, or in response to a direct problem that we know exists in our existing uh, uh, software. So there can all sort of be uh, sources of, of requirements. The important thing is that as far as our stories are concerned, these represent the, the why and the who of the story. Somebody out there is trying to get a real job done. They have something that motivates them, and our, our software is almost the thing that's uh, perhaps utilized to do that. But so far, everything in the business domain is uh, outside of that. It, this is the world of, of what's beyond our walls. Um, we therefore need to have a conversation uh, with technical people to understand how do I you know, uh, deploy, how do I uh, implement something from our technical domain that directly addresses that, uh, uh, that need or that requirement. And here, the, have I got it? Yep. So here's what I would call the, the what of the story. And I think it's very important to note that on any story, you should always be uh, uh, considering it as, as the place where options are considered. So that's why I draw this as a little bit of a, a cycle around the conversation, is that we say, okay, now that we have a deeper understanding of this problem, what are the options that we have for doing something about it? And as we, as we converge on a, on a potential option that we like, we can say, okay, we think that's the best choice to make. How much, how much design do we need to do to be able to understand that we can, we can commit to this, we can take this forward? So I, t I, I say that the, the outcome of selecting an option is that you, uh, you go so far as to having a, a design sketch. And that's, you know, that, that's whatever is an appropriate amount of detail for your context to, to be able to safely say, we agree with this, we have some idea of how long we think that will take, and therefore we'll commit this into our overall plan. Now, the other, um, and, and, and hence the point, the whole story is something that unites the requirement with an agreed solution. So it unites the why with the what. Now, there's two more things to add here. One is that I call the, uh, the business domain uh, our sphere of influence. Okay? So it's important to note that 
the things that we really want to impact out there in the world are, as I say, beyond our walls. So we don't have a direct handle on it. Contrast that with the technical domain. That is our zone of control. That's something that we can actually, and I'll, there you go. That is the last one. There's your camera icon. Um, uh, we, we have our hands on the levers of the technical domain. We can, we can make some kind of you know, management edict and say, we need this to happen technically, make it so. But you can't say, make that customer satisfied. You know, that's, that's, that's only ever something you can attempt to influence, you can't directly control it. So it is important when we're expressing our stories that we're very clear about what is the thing that we're trying to influence and what is the, the specific action that we're going to do that we believe will, ha will uh, result in that influence. So my colleague Goiko Adzik talks about impacts. Impacts are the thing that we are trying to uh, create, but we are creating that in the world, in our uh, sphere of influence. So we should always be uh, uh, bearing this, mind, this in mind as far as our testing is concerned as well. So most of the testing that we think of when we're saying, how do I test that a story is done, is about saying, did we do the technical thing that we intended to do? And did we do that right? But there's also an element of testing to say, OK, we expected that to have a positive impact out there in the, in the world. What would we look at? What would be the evidence we would expect to see to know that we've had that positive influence? You know, in other words, validate our assumptions about this technical change causing this positive impact. OK, so that's, that's the, the underlying theory here. Um, so let's return to uh, the, uh, uh, the much maligned uh, Canextra template. Um, so, well, what's good about it? Well, yeah, let's, let's start with that. Remember when this came out, it replaced nothingness, okay? Uh, user stories had been mentioned by Kent Beck in uh, his Extreme Programming Explained book, but there were no real uh, detailed examples of that. And certainly the, uh, uh, this particular structure uh, first sort of hit the world around 2001. I think it was at uh, the XP conference 2001 when Rachel Davies, who'd been working at uh, Canextra at the time, presented this, and it sort of took off like wildfire at that time. Um, so it was a very good and easy sort of set of training wheels you could bolt onto any Agile team and say, here's a great way to think about user stories that make sure you always address you know, the, the who, the what, and the why uh, the, the, in, in a nice sort of simple sentence. Fantastic stuff. But, you know, training wheels only get you so far. You know? uh, or, or Jeff Patton talks about, if you learn to ski, you're taught the snowplow. Is snowplow best practice? No, you don't see any professional skiers doing a snowplow, but you can be pretty sure that's probably what they started with. And I think we need to recognize that a template of any kind is really like the training wheels. As soon as you're, you're comfortable with what it is you're doing, you can, uh, you can move on. OK, so we know what the who, what, and why are. Um, what do we not like about this template? Well. Uh, Firstly, they're in the wrong order. I, I gave you that preamble about you, know, you start with why. You know, the, a problem exists in the world before we sort of have a solution to, to fix it. So I would therefore want my story expression to, uh, uh, to, to reveal that. I'd rather talk about why there's a problem, who has the problem that we're trying to uh, um, uh, uh, solve it for, and then say, and this is what we believe will do it. So what are some alternatives to that as a, I want so that? Well, um, uh, again, credit where it's due. This is, uh, other people have, have seen this problem and, and have proposed solutions to it. Uh, I think Chris Matz is largely credited with uh, being the one who suggested swap the order around by saying in order to, and then describe your, your problem, describe the why, uh, and then the rest is the same. So in order to achieve some goal, as a, as a, uh, a trader, I, I want some feature in the, in the software. So that's probably the, the easiest uh, hack or the easiest fix. Um, some people say, well, even in order to is just a little bit too much noise words. So this is arguably the, uh, the lightest version that I've ever come across. Say, to achieve something, uh, somebody needs a solution. Uh, I quite like that. Um, and I, I uh, tend to keep the, uh, the, the first, but I, I, what I don't like about the first style is the, the first person perspective. So I prefer to be more explicit about the fact that something we, we expect to have some 
uh, effect out there in the sphere of influence, and therefore we are going to do something that we have the, the choice of making. So I say, in order to fix something for somebody out there, we will choose to do something in our, in our software. So it's really, I, I say this is an explicit separation of influence and control. It's also because often your stories will sound a bit artificial if you're pretending that users really are asking for the stuff that you're going to build. In, you know, in the vast majority of cases, that probably isn't happening. You, your product owner, your team, you are uh, uh, innovating. You're coming up with ideas that you believe are going to be useful, and that's perfectly fine. You know, I say that uh, uh, you know, good stories or indeed good software uh, is often like good service in a restaurant. It's all those little things that happen without you asking for them but delight you because they make your experience better. That's, th that's good value to you. So it's fine for us to say nobody has asked for this feature, but we have, you know, we're trying this as an experiment. We believe this is going to have a positive influence on what they do. It's fine to do that, and I think this, you know, uh, uh, not insisting that every story is expressed as if somebody out there is asking for it is a more honest way to address that. Um, now, but then there is a, an issue of, of uh, level. Um, uh, and, and for this, I'm going to um, uh, channel the, uh, the underpants gnomes from, uh, from South Park. Uh, I'm sure by now most people are familiar with with this, aren't they? Is anyone familiar with the underpants gnomes meme? Okay, for those who, who aren't, here's the, the background. There's a character called Tweak uh, who keeps losing his underpants from his room, and his belief is that it's the underpants gnomes that are stealing them. Uh, and so he and the other lads from South Park uh, stay up, and in fact they do catch them in the act uh, and, and follow the gnomes back to, uh, back to their lair. Now the, the point is, the gnomes in South Park are the business geniuses. Okay, so they are the ones who, who, who understand how to, how to make money. They, they're these business geniuses. So the, 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 the boys get an insight into their, their grand business plan. And uh, let's, let's pick up the story there. A little bit of a pause and that will start. We have the lights down, please. This is where all our work is done. So what are you going to do with all these underpants that you steal? Collecting underpants is just phase one. Phase one, collect underpants. So what's phase two? Hey, what's phase two? Phase one, we collect underpants. Yeah, 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 but what about phase two? Well, phase three is profit. Get it? I don't get it. You see, phase one, collect underpants. Phase two? Phase three, profit. <laughs> So if you always wondered how to make minutes, uh, how to make uh, uh, make a profit, uh, there, there we are. Um, so the first problem uh, with the why and what separation is when uh, the level of why is too high. So the analogy there is my what is collecting underpants. So the story might be as an underpants gnome, I want to collect underpants so that profit. So we know profit is a good business reason. The problem is. We, we've got far too vast a distance between assuming that this weird technical thing like collecting underpants is in fact going to lead to that outcome. But if I'm honest, the more common problem is the other way around, is where instead of there being any difference between the why and the what, those are flattened out. And really the, the why is just the what. And that would be a story that sounds like, as an underpants gnome, I want to collect underpants so that I have a collection of underpants. So uh, it's, and, and as I say, this, this is the, by far the more common problem that I see in the world. Uh, it's where if you've got to sew that at all, it's a very lazy rewording. Uh, and the kind of problems that that causes is that it, it means that you're, you're, you're doubling up. You're really saying, you know, the reason why I need that, that uh, column on the, on the uh, transaction table is because well, the value is I need a column on the trans the database wants it. Um, so, you know, it, it becomes, uh, our solution becomes a foregone conclusion. And it takes away the point of being able to say, well, we should be able to have, uh, should be able to negotiate how much of a, uh, a solution do we need to provide? You know, what, what, what are our alternatives? Uh, and that's what stories need is, is room to be able to uh, uh, provide other options other than our first idea and to have the team negotiate the, uh, what is the best one. Okay, um, 
I know I'm, I'm running close to time, so I'm going to leave you one, one extra tip here, which is that uh, here's a little extra story hack that, uh, uh, that I like to put on, uh, deployed carefully. That is, I don't always add these to stories, but um, uh, it, it's proven to be useful in, in certain contexts. So it's where the complexity of the story is not clear because it's not, it's not obvious how this proposed story changes the status quo. Um, then, I can, then I will add a phrase saying, uh, in order to fix something for somebody, we will you know, implement some solution, whereas currently we only do X or Y. Okay? So I'm going to give you uh, some examples of that. So let's say uh, we're in a uh, uh, financial trading context. So we might have a story that says, in order to optimize trading while avoiding breaching regulations, for a trader, we'll warn them when their trading volume reaches 80% of their daily trading limit. Now, the question is, okay, we can make sense of that if, that's, if uh, we're, we're okay with that context, but it's hard to see from that on the surface how much work is involved in that. Because imagine there are th these three possible scenarios as to what, what, is, what happens today. So if the current situation today is, well, you know, they keep trading and then you know, we submit reports and then the, the Financial Conduct Authority comes back saying, you know, you breached regulations on this date, we have to pay a fine. So that's like the worst case, where there is, there is nothing that sort of implements those, uh, those limits. Or uh, case number two, maybe trading's blocked. You know, it just automatically shuts the trader out when they hit that limit, but they didn't realize. Or maybe it's something much more simple. Maybe we already have limits and warnings, but the limit is so close, uh, sorry, the warning is so close to the limit that that's not useful. We want to back that off a bit. So three very different sort of amounts of work to do based on what the current uh, situation is that is only revealed if you make that explicit. So, yeah, in the first you might be led to a story that says, okay, well, we need to prevent trading when the daily volume is limit. That would be the, the main thing to do in that first case, and the, the warning is almost a, a nice to have uh, in addition. If we've already got that, that stop, you know, prevent trading when the limit is hit, but give them a warning, then we'd have a story that says something to the effect of, well, uh, we want the, the story is about uh, giving the trader the maximum opportunity to take advantage of, okay, you've only got a certain amount of volume left. Uh, so it's about giving them appropriate time to make uh, appropriate trading strategies. There we've got the whereas currently trading is blocked without warning when the limit is reached. And then in the final case, it's probably just a case of you know changing a, a, a simple constant. Then we can express the story as in order to increase trading opportunities for a trader nearing their trading limit, we'll lower the warning threshold to 80% from 95%. Now notice here, I don't explicitly say whereas currently the, the limit is 95 because it was simply just to, to word it that way. So the whole point is, yeah, don't <laughs> just because I'm saying uh, I don't want you to be sla a slave to the old structure, don't be a slave to a, a new one either. Okay, so here's the summary because we're, uh, we're running out of time. So I suggest start with in order to and make the, the phrase you put in there about improving an outcome for somebody out there in the real world. So uh, good things are always saving time, uh, making things safer, making people more confident in what they do, reducing risk. Uh, it, it's always about improving a situation that already exists for somebody. Uh, when you're saying the, the who part, you know, so we're saying we're improving something for somebody, try to be as specific as possible there. Don't keep saying uh, for the user, for the user. Um, try to you know, put some adjectives in to bring that, uh, that person to life because it also helps you think it's probably only a subset or only a, uh, a particular uh, context in which people get benefit from their story. So let's utilize that phrase to be uh, uh, as accurate about that as possible. Um, when you're putting in the, the what part, uh, I again like to make sure that phrase always starts with a verb that really captures what is the change from the status quo. So try to think about what's different when we implement this compared to what we do at the moment. Uh, let that be uh, uh, articulated by the, the first verb in that phrase. And as I say, if it's useful to make that uh, distinction explicit, then uh, add a whereas currently. Okay, uh, and I believe that's me done.
Thanks very much.